I'm going to ask you please to stand up with your Bibles. We are going to stand to read the Holy Scripture, Luke 19, verses 11 through 27. I'll read it out loud for us. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable, because he was nearer to Jerusalem, and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your minna has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, your minna has made five minas. And he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Lord, here is your minna which I kept laid away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow? Why then did you not put my money in the bank and at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, take the minna from him and give it to the one who has the ten minas. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. This is the word of the Lord. You can be seated. Slide number two, please. Yeah, perfect. All right, so now we enter into the part of the book of Luke where we get to see the beginning of Jesus' last words. We know that they are therefore exceedingly important, right? Of course, all Jesus' words are very important. But just as if you were wrapping up your earthly life, you would begin to choose your words carefully, very methodically. You would want to say what was most important to you and on your heart. This is what we get to start seeing Jesus do now too. So let's listen carefully, girls. Our king is speaking. This week, the phrase that keeps ringing through my brain over and over again is, engage in business until I come. Engage in business until I come. The nobleman, the nobleman, is coming back. Are you engaging in his business? A huge part of being ready is knowing what's what. So I'm going to open with a boy kind of an illustration, which is a huge no-no in women's ministry. I'm going to do it everywhere anyway, but you can be relieved now in advance and know that it's not about sports. The boys in the Thronas family are not sporty guys, but they're huge into stuff like Arctic exploration and stuff, so we're going to have that kind of a boy illustration. All right. On an, in, uh, an expedition to the Antarctic, Sir Ernest Shackleton was forced to leave some of his men on a little island called Elephant Island. He intended to return, but he was unavoidably de uh, delayed, and when he finally set out, the water had frozen already and he was cut off from those that he was forced to leave behind. Three separate times he tried to reach these men, but he was blocked over and over again by the unyielding frozen sea. Finally, he located a narrow little channel through the ice, and guiding his vessel to the island, he was overjoyed to find the men alive and well. His men had their belongings already packed, and they were ready to get on board, and so they soon set sail for home. And when they were out of the dangerous waters, and it was touch and go, 
Shackleton asked why the men were able to leave on a moment's notice like that. And they told him that every single morning, their leader would wake up, roll up his sleeping bag, and shout, Get your things together, boys. The boss might be coming today. So these men knew that the stakes were incredibly high, and these men were therefore constantly at the ready. So as believers today, we want to be ready when Christ comes back, right? If Christ came back today, would you be ready to go? Today we're going to look a little more deeply into this parable, and I want us to talk about the nobleman, and I want us to talk about his servants. And I really, really, really want to talk about a thousand other things, but we won't have time. So will you pray with me now so that we don't waste our time in leaning on our own understanding? Father, I pray that you would open the eyes of our heart so that we can hear what it is that your spirit says to the church through this passage of scripture. We don't want to waste our time by being hearers of the word only, Lord. Please don't let any of us listen to this portion of your word through a filter of works righteousness. I pray that you'd help us all to hear grace, faith. Teach us all first and foremost, Lord, that none of us can do anything outside of your mercy and compassion. And then, Lord, make us into women who engage in business until you come. Help us not to reverse the order of those two things not this morning and not ever. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So when I think of the phrase, engage in business until I come, it makes me think of another really cool place in Scripture that some of you may remember if you studied the book of Daniel with us. Um, I don't know if you remember. Maybe you've never heard of Daniel, and that's awesome too. You are so welcome here. But in Daniel chapter 8, in verse 27, we read the neatest, neatest thing. It's right after Daniel receives a really terrifying vision from the Lord. And what he sees makes him actually feel physically sick. We won't get into that vision today because I can't hope to do it justice, not in one morning and probably not in one month. But suffice it to say, for our purposes this morning, that this little verse tells us that Daniel was overcome and that he lay sick for some days afterwards. And then we read this coolest little part. This is what it says. Then I rose and went about the king's business. He didn't understand the vision. He was appalled by the vision, in fact. But he got up anyway, and he busied himself about the king's business. And I think there is a hugely important lesson for us here. More times than not, I suspect we are not going to understand the chaos swirling in the world around us. I don't think half of the time we're going to understand the chaos swirling in our own hearts, our own families. Circumstances are often going to shake down to feel completely befuddling. We are going to be tempted and to be discouraged and even maybe to despair at certain junctures in this earthly life. We are going to be confused and we will likely ask our Lord, why, Father, at varying intervals. And you know what? That's okay. Go take your questions to the Lord and don't rail about him behind his back. Go right to the Father and tell him you're confused, you're befuddled, and you just don't get it. He can take your questions. And then, when you're done, rise up and get about the king's business. Do it even when you don't understand and do it even when you feel sick. Okay, the nobleman. For you note takers out there, and you're so cute, I really like you guys. Our sub points about the nobleman are what are his orders? What is this business that we're supposed to engage in? He gets to decide what is just. And then he is coming back. Do you believe it? Or phrased slightly differently. Do you live as though you believe it? So what are the nobleman's orders? We see him here calling 10 of his servants. He gives them 10 minas and tells them to engage in business until he comes back. The servants have no idea when he's coming back. All they know is that he has gone into a foreign country to receive for himself a kingdom. 
They know that his trip is productive, and they know that his trip is necessary. And they know their orders in the meantime. And they also know that everybody around them does not necessarily love their master. They also know that because they're his representatives, that'll very likely mean that these same citizens who hate their master may well also hate them. So do you know your orders? What is this business that we're supposed to engage in? I feel like we come constantly back to Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. Remember um, the Great Commission? Also, 1 Peter 4.10 gives us some really telling instructions, I think, on this point. And even though we come constantly back to the Great Commission, I think that we can't hear it enough. We need to read and reread and then reread again our marching orders. These are from Jesus. So this is what he says there in that Matthew portion. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And then in that Peter portion that I just referred to, we read, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So our job is to get busy. Our job is to be alert. Our job is to be ready. We need to serve each other. What do you think our modern-day minas could be? What has God generously entrusted to you? I'm asking, what do you think modern-day minas could be? Family. Did I hear someone say time? Time. What else? Money. Money. Definitely. Gifts. Talents. Yes. What else? Circum. Yes. Places you're put in, circumstances you find yourself situated in, friendships you find yourself a part of. Yeah, I think all of that. What about, and this is really near and dear to my heart because I'm perimenopausal now, and I would estimate I've lost 50% of my brain power. I am praying it comes back. But what about a good, quick, cooperative brain? I think that's a minna. I wish I had that minna. Physical abilities. Special talents, other resources. I think a lot of things could constitute a modern-day minna. Spiritual gifts, somebody mentioned that. There are several places in Scripture that list out long listings of spiritual gifts. Um, You can even Google online spiritual gift assessments if you don't know what yours are. Every Christian has one or more spiritual gifts. And if we use them to help our fellow Christians and our fellow man in general, God's rewards promise to be great. One day, you never know, he may look at you, sister, and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Wouldn't that be incredible? To hear him say to us one day, good job, good and faithful servant, my friend. Just like he called Abraham his friend. I can't conceive of a cooler, more transcendent moment in human existence than to get to hear that one day. But do you know what I think would be a super huge waste of our time? Looking over at our sister over there and thinking, wow, her gift looks so much shinier than mine. Do you know what I mean by that? Let me ask you a pointed question. Do you sometimes find yourself wasting your time envying the 10-minute guy or the 5-minute guy? Or do you just keep busy focusing on multiplying the value of your own minna? It makes me think of Exodus 20, verse 17, which is one of the Ten Commandments, so we know it's super important, right? This is what it says. 
You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything else that is your neighbor's. We are not to covet anything belonging to our neighbor, and that includes spiritual gifts. I have to confess right now that I have been guilty of this. I watch the evangelists among you sharing your faith in the Lord Jesus, and I see people excitedly wanting to know about this Jesus, and I marvel at your gift, and I dazzle at your gift, and I sometimes even covet your gift. But that's sin, and I'm wasting my time when I do that, right? I think it's also arrogant and not very grateful, because really what I'm saying in my great and lofty wisdom in those moments is, Really, God, I think you've misassigned the gifts here. No. My job is to humbly use the gifts that he, in his perfect wisdom, has assigned to me. And 1 Corinthians 12, 4 and 5 says this. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So we're given these gifts to serve each other, not to hoard for ourselves or to bury deep in the ground out of fear. Use your gifts. You are accountable to do it. So did you hear the coveting going on in our passage today? At the end, when the nobleman is distributing the reward... He takes away the minna from the unfaithful servant, doesn't he? And he says, or he gives it to the one who already has 10. And what do they say? Lord, he has 10 minas. I think maybe that's an ancient way of saying, hey, that's not fair. I think it's perfectly acceptable to say, Lord, I can't understand. Or, Lord, I just can't make sense of this right now. But I don't think it's okay to say to God, the creator of the universe, and everything that ever was or ever will be. God, you made a bad call here. Maybe if you could ask me first next time, I could help you figure that out. It sounds ridiculous when you phrase it that way, right? So this leads me to our next point, which is that the nobleman gets to decide what's just. Any idea that you or I have of a concept of perfect justice can only ever stem from the most beautiful version of it we've ever seen. And the most beautiful incarnation we've ever seen of perfect justice is but a pale shadow of true justice, which is authored by who? The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We only value justice to begin with because the Lord is just and because he determined that justice is important and good. Who are we, his creatures, to indignantly tell our creator that his decisions are not fair? He knows fair. He will author fair. And we can rest in his vastly better judgment. So I think it's so fascinating when you pick through this parable that the unprofitable servant isn't judged for failing to gain as much as the other two guys gained. That's not what this was about. He was judged for failing to use what he had. So what about you, dear sister? Are you using your spiritual gifts for the strengthening of the bride, which is a Bible way of saying the church? Are you using your gifts to bless your brothers and sisters in Christ? Get busy, friend. We don't know when he's coming back. And he is coming back. So do you believe it? Does your life look as though you believe it? Slide 11, please. I'm going to read to us a portion out of one of my favorite books in the world. And it's called The Silver Chair. And it is by C.S. Lewis. And if you don't know it already, it's part of a seven-set series called The Chronicles of Narnia. And in the scene I'm about to read to you, we're going to see two children named Jill and Scrub and their strange travel companion called Puddle Glum, who is a strange mythical creature called a Marsh Wiggle. And they have set out to rescue Prince Rillian, who is a Narnian prince who has been taken captive underground by an evil witch. 
And our scene opens with the five of them deep in the witch's underground castle as she tries to lull them all into forgetting that there is a place called Narnia, that there is a place above ground. So settle in. This is a bit long, but it is more than a bit good. Listen carefully and ask yourself, how does this resemble the world around me today in 2023 as I live? Now, the witch said nothing at all, but moved gently across the room, always keeping her face and eyes very steadily toward the prince. When she had come to a little ark set in the wall not far from the fireplace, she opened it and took out first a handful of a green powder. This she threw in the fire, and it did not blaze much, but a very sweet and drowsy smell came from it. And all through the conversation which followed, the smell grew stronger and filled the room and made it harder to think. Secondly, she took out a musical instrument, rather like a mandolin. She began to play it with her fingers, a steady, monotonous thrumming that you didn't even notice anymore after a few minutes. But the less you noticed it, the more it got into your brain and your blood. This also made it hard to think. And after she had thrummed for a time, and the sweet smell was now strong, she began speaking in a sweet, quiet voice. Narnia, she said. Narnia? I have often heard your lordship utter that name. Dear prince, you are very sick. There is no land called Narnia. Yes, there is, though, ma'am, said Puddleglum. You see, I happen to have lived there my entire life. Indeed, said the witch. Tell me, I pray you, where that country is. Up there, said Puddleglum, stoutly pointing overhead. I don't know exactly where. How, said the queen with a sweet, soft, musical laugh. Is there a country up among the stones and mortar on the roof? No, said Puddleglum, struggling a little to get his breath. It's an overworld. And what or where, pray, is this? How do you call it, this overworld? Don't be silly, said Scrub, who was fighting hard against the enchantment of the sweet smell and the thrumming. As if you didn't know, it's up above. It's where you can see the sky and the sun and the stars. Why, you've been there yourself. We met you up there. I cry you mercy, little brother, laughed the witch. You couldn't have heard a lovelier laugh. I have no memory of that meeting, but we often meet our friends in strange places when we dream. And unless all dreamed alike, you must not ask the others to remember it. Madame, said the prince sternly, I have already told your grace that I am the king's son of Narnia and shall be, dear friend, said the witch in a soothing voice, as if she was humoring a child. Shall be king of many imagined lands in thy fancy. We've been there too, snapped Jill. She was getting very angry because she could feel the enchantment getting hold of her every moment. But of course, the very fact that she could still feel it, showed that it had not yet fully worked. And thou art queen of Narnia too, are you pretty lass? I am nothing of the sort, said Jill, stamping her foot. We come from another world. Why, this is an even prettier game than the other one, said the witch. Tell us, little maid, where is this other world? What ships and chariots go between it and ours? And of course, a lot of things darted into Jill's head. Things about home, her boarding school, her friends, airplanes, cars, lineups, but they all seemed dim and far away. Thrum, 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 went the strings of the witch's instrument. Jill couldn't remember the names of the things in our world anymore. And this time it didn't even come into her head that she was being enchanted, for now the magic was in its full strength. And of course, the more enchanted you are, the more you feel like you're not enchanted at all. She found herself saying, and at the moment it was a relief to say, no, I suppose that other world must all be a dream. Yes, it is a dream, said the witch. Yes, a dream, said Jill. There never was such a world, said the witch. No, said Scrub, there never was such a world. Never any world but mine, said the witch. No world but yours, said they. But Puddleglum was yet fighting hard. I don't know rightly what you mean by a world, he said, talking like a man who didn't have enough air. But you can play that fiddle till your fingers drop off, and you still won't make me forget Narnia and the whole overworld, too. You'll never see it again, maybe I wouldn't wonder. You may have blotted it out and turned it dark like this for all I know, nothing more likely. But I know that I was once there. I've seen the sky full of stars. 
I've seen the sun coming up out of the sea of a morning and sinking behind the mountains at night. And I've seen the sun up in the midday sky when I couldn't look at him for brightness. Puddleglum's words had a very rousing effect. The other three all breathed again and looked at one another like people newly wakened. Why, there it is, cried the prince. Of course, the blessing of Aslan upon this honest marsh wiggle. We've all been dreaming these last few minutes. How could we have forgotten it? Of course we've seen the sun. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Then she makes a very dangerous mistake and calls into question Aslan, who is a lion and who is the Christ figure in the Chronicles of Narnia. Aslan, said the witch, quickening ever so slightly at the pace of her thrumming. What a pretty name. What can it mean? He is the great lion who called us out of our own world, said Scrub, and sent us into this to find Prince Relian. What is a lion? said the witch. Oh, hang it all, said Scrub. Don't you know? How can we describe it to her? Have you ever seen a cat? Surely, said the queen, I love cats. Well, a lion is a little bit, only a little bit, mind you, like a huge cat, but with a mane. And it's yellow and terrifically strong. The witch shook her head. I see, she said, that we should do no better with your lion as we did as we imagined through your son together. You have seen lamps, and so you imagined a bigger and better lamp and called it your son. You've seen cats, and now you want a bigger and better cat, and you want it to be called a lion. Well, what a pretty little make-believe game you children play. It would suit you all better if you were younger. And look how you can put nothing into your make-believe world without copying it from the real world, this world of mine, which is the only world. But even you children are too old for such play. And as for you, my lord prince, thou art a man full grown. Fie upon you. Are you not ashamed of such toys? Come, all of you, put away these childish tricks. I have work for all of you in the real world. There is no Narnia, no overworld, no sky, no sun, no Aslan. And now to bed all. And let us begin a wiser life tomorrow. They're standing there. Their cheeks are flushed. All is very nearly lost. But Puddleglum, desperately gathering all of his strength, walked over to the fire, and then he did a very brave thing. He knew it wouldn't hurt him quite as much as it would hurt a, a human, for his feet, which were bare, were webbed and hard and cold-blooded like a duck's. But he knew it would hurt him badly enough, and so it did. With his bare foot, he stamped on the fire, grinding a large part of it into ashes on the flat hearth. And three things happened at once. First, the sweet, heavy smell grew very much less. For though the whole fire had not been put out, a very good portion of it had been. And what remained smelled very largely of burnt marsh wiggle, which is not at all an enchanting smell. This instantly made everyone's brain far clearer. The prince and the children held up their heads again and they opened their eyes. Secondly, the witch, in a loud and terrible voice, utterly different from all of the sweet tones she had just been using up until now, called out, What are you doing? Dare to touch my fire again, mud filth, and I'll turn the blood to fire inside of your veins. I'm getting all worked up here. <laughs> Thirdly, the pain itself made Puddle Glub's head for a moment perfectly clear. It was pain that, that was needed and he knew exactly what he really thought. There is nothing like a good shock of pain for dissolving certain kinds of magic. We're going to stop there, but what happens next is the witch is turned into her real self, which is a slithery, green, gigantic, ugly snake, and it gets better from there. So this is what I know, want to know about you. Have you been lulled into forgetting your overworld? What makes you drowsy? We have a couple of slides, they're number three and four, and we're going to have a time where we chat at our tables briefly. I've got a bunch of questions I'm going to ask um, to have the two slides rotated through, please, Carla. And um, I want us to talk about the kinds of things that distract you, because we're all going to be distracted by different things. And again, I want us to fast forward through all the small talk, and I want us to get real fast with our sisters. Go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Okay. I just want you to know that just because I'm long-winded doesn't mean you have to stay here seated until I'm done, right? We're technically over at 11.30, so you're free any time after that, and it's not rude if you have to go. However, I have three more pages. <laughs> so I will give you a synopsis, but I don't want us to finish our time together before we talk about those servants, right? We're going to ignore the seven servants that we hear nothing more about. We're going to ignore those guys. Um, the wicked servant is so memorable, right? Fear clearly motivated his poor choices. Cowardice causes him to hide the truth and the mina or minna. Um, fear prevents him from trusting his master. Do you notice too that there's more than just fear at play here? He's making excuses for himself, isn't he? He's blaming others for his decisions, isn't he? Yeah, it reminds me of the Garden of Eden. Do you make excuses for yourself? I do. So he, he, he's blaming the master for possessing a flawed and ferocious reputation. Do you think what he believed about the master was accurate or true here? The other two faithful servants didn't seem to believe these same things about him, did they? I think many, many people distort the truth of God's character. And so we use it and it kind of paralyzes us. Some people use predestination as an excuse to not evangelize or tell others about their Lord Jesus. So we're going to fast forward all this, but I want you to think about the ways you have heard the, the truth of God's character distorted in the world around you. It's distorted in countless ways through the prosperity gospel. God wants you to be healthy and wealthy, stuff like that. But there are all kinds of different lies about the Lord that circulate. And it makes me think of this amazing Jen Wilkin quote. She says, the heart cannot love who the mind does not know. And so just as a quick little suggestion, something that's really been helping me in the last year, I just started this. I made a little journal, and I entitled it, Things I Know to be True About God the Father. 
And I just keep it near my precept study desk. And as I go through scripture, because this is the only sure place for us to learn things about our God, I do a little triangle in my margin, because a triangle for me uh, indicates God the Father. I mark it there, and then later on I transfer it into this book. So I have a book full, well, it's not nearly full. I'm starting to get a book full about only true things about God the Father. And that helps me recognize the lies when I'm out and about in the world. All right, Uh, I had a bunch of verses that we were gonna go through to find true things about the Lord, but there are all sorts of true things about our Father in this book, and you can do that for yourself. Um, If you think to yourself, I'm new here, I'm sitting around looking at all these other ladies and they know how to flip their Bibles so fast as she's referencing verses, I think I should just quit. I can't keep up with these people. That is a lie. Today is a good day to start learning about the character of God the Father. Today is the perfect day to start learning the truth about God the Father. There's nothing else more important. Don't compare yourself to others. Um, I'm going to end with telling us that pretty soon, because remember with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. So in God's timeline, pretty soon, the nobleman is coming back. He leaves his servants behind to carry on his work, to trade the minas that he has entrusted to our care, to inject the love of God into the world's pain. The servants are not required to be eloquent or educated or especially gifted. Only one thing is required from his servants, and we learned about it clearly, to be trustworthy, to be faithful, to know the character of their master, to be people who can be depended upon to work well in his absence. God became flesh so that he could come into the world of heartache and tears. He came into the hurt, healing blind eyes as well as broken hearts. And then the world, the citizens, they sent him away. They hated him. This parable explains where he is now and why he is there. Which changes the question for us now to where are his servants? Where are those to whom the Savior in his absence has entrusted his good work? To live as he lived and love as he loved, putting themselves last as he put himself last. Where are those he has called to be his hands and his voice and his feet, extending themselves to the beggars on the roadside, calling up to the tax collectors in the trees, traveling the uphill road to the cross? As for the servants who faithfully toil amidst so much physical and emotional and spiritual pain, sometimes it's hard for them to not brood over the question that suffering raises. But the servant has only one question really to ask herself. And the question is not, is this king living for now in a distant country worthy of my trust? But instead, I think it is for us today Will I be worthy of his? So let's pray together, sisters. Father, there's nothing more important than one day getting to hear out of your holy lips, well done, good and faithful servant. The fact is, we don't really know how to do that moment to moment, day to day, hour to hour. But we ask you to do it in us. We're lost without you. You're our only hope. But we long to spend our eternities with you. Would you please convict us of our sin, especially the sin we don't even know about yet? Would you make us women who are busy about the king's business, women who use the gifts that you have given us without crediting ourselves for them for the strengthening of our brothers and sisters? Would you make us women who, even when we feel sick and confused or homesick for heaven, Just rise up again once more and get about your business. We want to please you, and our only hope of getting to do that is asking you to work in each of us that which is pleasing in your sight. Use us, Father, to be your hands and your feet. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. All right. Have a great week. See you later, alligator.